everybody. Welcome to the afternoon. I hope you guys had a great time with your breakout sessions. Um, I was in the IP and tech transfer track. So much information. It really gives us just a taste of what was going on. But we get to kick off the afternoon with our special guest, uh, Dr. Bob Suter, um, now VP and practice lead at the Fulcrum Group, for practice lead for emerging technologies at the the Futurum group, excuse me. Um, no, did I say that right? Futurum. Futurum. Right. Thank you. He messed me. I was teasing uh, him earlier that he messed me up because he switched jobs on me. So congratulations. And thank you. Uh, I'm really happy to hear you. I will go ahead and let you share your screen uh, your for your keynote presentation. And we'll monitor and, and let you know when people have some questions. All right. Very good. Let me uh, put up. All right. Um, let me just, just one sec. Okay. Yeah, perfect. You can see this? Okay. Uh, yet, yes, just a little background. Um, you know, I've had a kind of an interesting career. I spent 39 years at IBM. And um, sometimes people would ask me, you know, why did you leave? And it's like, well, I was there for 39 years. I can leave if I want to. Uh, but I spent the, the last couple of years at a company uh, called Inflection, originally called Cold Quanta. Um, uh, they do quantum. They also do other quantum technologies. So I went from uh, superconducting quantum computing to more general quantum applications. And um, I started less than a week ago at uh, the Futurum Group, which is an analyst consultant group. Uh, we help companies understand really the big picture. Uh, I'm focusing on quantum, but also uh, some of the more advanced AI topics like generative AI, LLM, and, and so forth. Uh, but I've been uh, involved with quantum since about 2016. And since that time, um, I well I had to learn a lot about it. And in, in part, uh, when I decided I did need to learn a lot about it, of course, I started looking around to for material for books. And there were several you know, good books, but none that really fit the way I thought. I'm a mathematician by training with a lot of computer science. So ultimately I wrote a book, um, at least you know for, for me. Uh, I, if, if I have to learn something, I might as well write it down. Uh, so that caused me to think a lot about uh, quantum, quantum computing in general, uh, even though I've worked for two vendors over the last few years. Um, I do uh, have, let's say, an industry-wide view of, of quantum computing, where it came from, who's doing what, um, but really what's more important is, and, and where does it need to go, right? It's nice to say, oh, quantum is amazing and quantum mechanics and this and that, um, but ultimately we need useful quantum computers. And uh, the ones we have now, as we'll talk about, um, aren't quite there yet. Uh, and so uh, after kind of a brief introduction to this notion of quantum com computing, uh, because I know we have an audience um, with, with a mixed background on this, um, I, I'm really going to focus on those elements. So if this is where we are now, what do we have to do? Now, one of the features of quantum computing is that if you know classical computing, uh, there are a lot of gotchas. There are things that just don't work in quantum. They don't work that way. We'll explore that a little bit. And, you know, frankly, we could even get philosophical about it at times. So, so, so let's, let's jump in here um, and um, get, get started. So the first thing to set expectations um, is this concept of reality. Uh, people are very grounded, of course, in, in what they've learned, what they've learned in science and in math and so forth. And they often have this sense of the axioms of the universe. The universe must work this way. And when quantum mechanics came around, starting around 1900, it hurt the heads of many, many people, many, many smart people. And it replaced a lot of the theories or augmented the theories of what we knew about, for example, electricity, about what we knew about atoms and so forth. Uh, in some ways, it complemented. It was the very small compared to the very large with Einstein and relativity and gravity and, and so forth like this. Um, but this notion of reality, if you get too stuck on it and 
say, well, I'm, I know the way the universe works. Um, quantum computing, you know, to use a phrase I, I did before, will really hurt your head uh, because it's probably not the case. Um, and, and so much so, I mean, here is to uh, pretty, pretty good sciences. I mean, genius is for the, the ages. And uh, while they, they, they certainly lived in very different times, uh, they had very different views of this sense of reality and ultimately how physics and chemistry and, and now quantum computing works. And so Einstein in 1926 to Max Born, who was also a Nobel Prize winner in physics, said, uh, I am not at all convinced that he does not play dice. And here um, we're not, he meant God, but in um, a, a metaphysical sense, right? That that whatever controls the universe. Well, come forward about 73 years and Stephen Hawking says, well, kind of on the contrary. Uh, so God does play dice with the universe. All the evidence points to him being an inveterate gambler who throws the dice on every possible occasion. And what led Einstein astray, most people feel, is that he was so locked into his sense of reality, the way things must work. And he was a pretty creative thinker. Um, and so he was very skeptical of a lot of what was being developed with quantum mechanics, what was really going on in the physics of the very small, that while he didn't necessarily make a lot of contributions in the second half of his life, he asked very hard questions. And in answering these questions, much of what we know and the way the theory evolved and ultimately played into what we're going to talk about with quantum computing came into this. So uh, the world has changed a tremendous amount. I mean, this this uh, quote about Einstein less than 100 years ago, right? So um, things are, have moved very quickly, particularly in the last century. Uh, and so we have to press reset on your, your reality button, so to speak. And so as the, we think about computing, you know, for anybody who's really kind of gotten into it or has a sense of it, you get this idea that, you know, it's all zeros and ones, right? All the data we can think of as zeros and ones. You throw a bunch of them together in the right order, you get numbers. Uh, in other orders, you get characters. You build this up and you get images and, and you get videos and music and, and all this type of thing. Um, and really, this is what we call classical computing. It's the base for our phones, our laptops, and even the supercomputers, right? Um, or any of the servers that you use on the web and the cloud and so forth. And uh, there are, you know, amazing uh, theoretical computer science results that say, boy, if you have this problem, we can, we can solve it using classical computing. Uh, footnote, footnote, it may take 5 million years and use more memory than we can ever possibly manufacture, right? So um, there, there's a slight problem there. And um, it is not the way that nature works at the lowest level. That is, nature is not digital. In many ways, nature is analog. Richard Feynman, uh, the, the infinitely quotable physics professor from Caltech who won the 1965 Nobel Prize in Phoenix, has this, this quote from a paper in 1981, uh, nature isn't classical, damn it. If you want to make a simula simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical, right? The theory that underlies how nature works in the small. And by golly, <laughs> it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy, right? For Nobel Prize winners, obviously, they don't go after easy problems. You want to really test yourself. And so um, with this, um, in black and white, you know, we can make three statements here. So quantum mechanics, which is the physical part of all this, is hard. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of reshaping of your thoughts. Um, there's a lot of, uh, in the physical theory, a lot of very advanced calculus, um, all sorts of things. And, and it stretches across many different areas. And therefore, quantum computing, the notion of quantum computing, it is hard for many, uh, though as we get better at it, and in particular, as, as we develop higher level software, it will become easier. But making a useful quantum computer, right, a, a computer that can do better than anything we can do now on problems we care about will be really hard. And I want to stress the future tense here. 
will be. Because arguably, in almost every case, we do not have useful quantum computers today. Great progress is being made, and people are pushing the boundaries in lots of different ways. But there are many, many um, hurdles to be overcome uh, with, with, with quantum computing, and, and that's really what we're going to discuss. But you know, if it's so hard, why are we bothering, right? Um, you know, our classical world, I, I, I mean, the supercomputer is the cloud. We have so much computing power, and it's applied to things like AI, large language models. Um, however, some hard problems are intractable. Now, tractable is a wonderful, wor wor a wonderful word as distinguished from impossible. Intractable just means that right now, with what we have available, we cannot solve those problems. We may in the future, just as there were problems in the 1940s, the 1950s, with some of the early computers they certainly couldn't solve, we can do on our phones right now. So as technology develops and we understand what the problems are, right, we, we start getting goals and we get smarter and we innovate. Um, and ultimately, we, we hope to do this. And here are some example hard problems. So simulation of physical systems. And this is really what Feynman was talking about, that because nature is in classical, we can't apply our digital or binary types of computers and do very well. Um, and in that same way, when we think of physical systems, we have to think of chemistry. So that goes into new batteries, new materials, medicines. Uh, and also, you know, creating fertilizers. We use a non-trivial percentage amount of all the energy on the earth just creating fertilizers. And so that's important to agriculture, which is important to feeding people, which is an important societal problem, right? So we don't just think of these as hard calculations. They actually affect people. Logistical optimization. Um, how do you get the right people in the right places uh, when you have many, many different factors that are going on. Combinatorial optimization, situations where there are so many different possibilities, often where they're, they're related to each other in complicated ways that we can perhaps approximate a solution, but we can't get an exact solution. Many factor risk assessment. Uh, risk assessment is, is just so universal. <laughs> I want to do something. What are the risks? How do I weigh it? Well, if I weighed possibly uh, everything that could come into this with every possible combination of, of the probabilities of any, anything happening, uh, it's a very hard problem. Uh, machine learning, so AI, right? Computational fluid dynamics. Uh, how does a fluid like air flow over a car, flow over an, an airplane? Very hard problem. Weather forecasting, you know, the, the, the forever hard problem that, that people care about. Um, optimized energy networks. When I was a kid, you know, there was a power plant. In my case, I lived in New York. A lot of the power came from um, Niagara Falls. There was an outage, and pretty much the whole state was, was uh, blacked out because of that. Now we have solar feeding into the network. We have hydro feeding into, you know, all sorts of ways. So um, that is, it is a true network with things entering and exiting. And then finally, I'll say breaking encryption protocols. It's a very hard problem. And it's often seen as a risk associated with quantum computing. I will not really be focusing on, on that day. Um, it's really a cybersecurity issue. Um, that is, you really need to use the latest cybersecurity protocols um, and systems and so forth to do this. Um, but it is a hard problem. And uh, uh, once broken, it will fundamentally change our world unless people start adopting these, these new, new protocols that are being standard. So what can we do? Okay, well, if we have these hard problems and the current tools are not sufficient, hey, let's create a new tool. And uh, quantum computing, people have been thinking about it. Um, though I quoted Feynman um, earlier from the 1980s, there were several other people who were considering this as well. Uh, he, he was, as I said, very quotable, so he, he often gets a lot of the credit. Um, but it was this notion of creating a quantum computer, a computer that fundamentally used the same rules 
that quantum mechanics did and does uh, in, in, in nature. You know, nature is the biggest computer in the universe, literally, right? Um, if, if you think about everything, all the electrons, all the photons, all the atoms, everything uh, that, that um, constitutes matter, including us and including everything we can see around us, right? Uh, we are, <laughs> we're the software, if you will, the way we operate um, on all this matter that nature is controlling. I give several examples here um, because there are different ways of creating quantum computers. Some are manufactured, some use more natural methods, if you will, um, but none of them are perfect. None of them, um, because uh, to, to really do anything perfectly here, we'd have to do it in a complete isolated vacuum, right? No light, nothing whatsoever. Well, the problems with sticking something in such an environment is you can't talk to it. Because the moment you open up a little little hole to somehow talk to the thing, there's a problem with the outside environment polluting what's what's going on. Uh, just one photon of light would completely destroy uh, a quantum computing calculation on several of these different types. So we've got IBM, the famous kind of golden chandelier that's used by everybody who is doing what's called the superconducting modality. Uh, Xanadu, based in Toronto, does a photonic where they use light, actual photons. Um, ion Q and Continuum use ions. So an ion is an atom where you typically either added or subtracted an electron. Well, they have charge and you can do different things with them. And the quantumness uh, is embodied in those electrons. There's something You are doing something to those ions removing their, uh, their ions. Uh, Qera, uh, along with my my uh, last company, Inflection, several others are, are doing neutral atoms. So that is neutral in charge, things like cesium, things like rubidium, and you hit them with lasers, and the lasers do amazing things to actually do the computing. And then finally, I mentioned D-Wave, which is a very different type of computing. Um, they use uh, quantum techniques to do simulated annealing is a technique that goes back to the 1940s. And uh, as a lot of computing goes back to the era around uh, World War II, um, but it's a superconducting technology. So people are really trying to figure out what is the best way of, of doing this. And the answer ultimately is probably going to be several of these plus some we haven't even invented yet, right? Um, I probably won't be around in 50 years from now, but um, I strongly suspect there'll be one or two new things that uh, aren't on this list. And, and also, by the way, there, there are several more that I just haven't highlighted today here. So um, I have this little warning sign. This is the only slide that really has any math of substance, but um, I, I, I'm doing it for, for a purpose here. Uh, classically, we call the bit. It holds... Um, one piece of information, a zero or a one, and it can hold the zero or one, um, only one of those values at a time, right? A qubit, a quantum bit, holds two pieces of information. And by the way, those pieces of information are much more complicated than just a zero or a one. And we, when we're doing quantum computing, we get uh, expressions such as those on the right-hand side. And so I will read this uh, thing with A and B. Uh, technically, it's A ket zero plus B ket one. All right. Well, we're not going to worry about these kets and things like this, but it seems to be a little bit of zero and a little bit of a one thing, right? This. And the A and the B are not just regular numbers. They're, they're complex numbers. That is, they have the square root of negative one, and they must obey this condition. Okay. So that's really the end of the math. But it is for this reason why people sometimes smile and say a qubit can be zero and one at the same time. It doesn't mean that a qubit is like 0 0.5 or halfway in between. It means it's sort of a combination in an interesting way. And oh, this, these A and the Bs, they are related to probabilities. Um, there's geometry going on in the math, probability and so forth. But this is the concept of superposition right, where we have both values being represented to, to some degree, right, and there are rules about how we can do that. Uh, to bring this down to a much simpler example, if I tell you, okay, walk three blocks east and two blocks north, 
well, I can write this using similar notation, three for A and two for B, as three cat east plus two cat north. And you're like, well, okay. <laughs> you know, you gave me the coordinates of where I should work. Exactly right. Exactly right. So, you know, if you wanted to make a statement, a very exciting statement, hey, I'm east and north at the same time, you know, with the same degree of enthusiasm. Uh, people say, I'm zero and one at the same time. Um, well, most people aren't going to think that's very exciting. But that's the math. And the math is really pretty easy. The math is much easier than, than the straightforward physics on this. And that's why we do spend time actually explaining the math behind this. It, it's more complicated than just traditional programming here. Now, there's this other interesting thing that goes on. I said with one qubit, we have two pieces of information. Okay, well, with two qubits, we have four pieces of information. Well, that's not terribly deep because, well, I have one of them with two and the other one with two, and two plus two seems to be four. However, we're not talking two plus two, we're talking two times two. Because when we add a third qubit, we have eight pieces of information. If we go up to 10 qubits, we have 1,024. That is, we have two times two times two, 10 times to get to 1,024. Every time we add another qubit, we double the amount of information. So even at 100, this is a very large number, 1.26 times 10 to the 30th. That's one with 30 zeros following it. And with 275, I want to highlight here on, the, on this next slide that that number, 275, is bigger than um, the number of atoms we estimate in the observable universe. So if we have a quantum computer with 275 perfect qubits, which I will not define at the moment, we can manipulate information, more pieces of information than there are in the observable universe. Well, that's cool, but that's not like adding more memory to a phone or a laptop or things like this. There's no physical location for all of these pieces of information. And so in this way, quantum computing is really analog. It's not digital, right? And the representation is completely different. There are completely different rules. And the general idea is if we have n qubits, the number of pieces of information, um, before we have to put on a couple of constraints, is, is two to the nth, and that's a whole lot. And that's why this gets interesting. This is exponential growth. And a lot of times exponential growth is not a good thing, all right? Because people, um, it's things getting out of control, except of course, if it's compound interest and it's your money, that's exponential growth, then you think it's a perfectly fine thing. But if quantum has this exponential growth related to qubits and, and various concepts of this, can we use that to control the bad exponential growth that is related to trying to solve some of those other problems. Now, quantum is not useful for every hard problem. Generally speaking, there are about three classes of problems. So there are things, for example, that have applications in machine learning um, in computational fluid dynamics. There are certain optimization problems, and then things like chemistry, you know, in, in the physical world. So this is not a panacea for every hard problem we can think of. Uh, it's not going to replace classical computing. It's going to work alongside. So um, it's not really a hybrid. It's we're integrating the different techniques of how to do this in the same way as we, we did integrate GPUs with regular old CPUs, right? We brought them together. We use them uh, for the right sorts of problems, the right types of, of computations here. Now, there's another concept called entanglement. And um, this is uh, what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. Uh, and uh, it's useful looking that up, why he called that. It's very hard to explain uh, frequently. Um, the math is not hard to explain. Um, uh, but there was this article that came out about a year and a half ago in The New Yorker, which I highly recommend. Um, allows me to cheat. I don't have to have lots of slides on it. I can just say, go read this. But this is a key, key quote about this. And this is what I think you have to remember, which is, it's not the idea of thinking of two things that suddenly are connected in a way that uh, they're no longer independent, right? 
Uh, whereas once entanglement happens, they are really one object, right? With two subparts. And um, it, it changes your perspective on this. And this is an area where you, you could get philosophical and what does this all mean? And, and are there entangled particles that happened at the Big Bang, one that's fairly close to us and one that could be you know, trillions of light years away? and things like this. But this is an essential part of the quantum computing model and does not exist classically. And so we use this in many, many different ways, in many, many different algorithms uh, in a way that cannot be done classically. Um, but, um, you know, if, I, if I'm going to give you some great new stuff, maybe I got to take some things away. Um, before when I talked about these cats and zero and one at the same time, the moment you look at the state of a qubit, so if you know how to code, you think of variables, you know, uh, what is the value of X, right? If you the value of X and it happened to be quantum information, it would completely collapse. You cannot peak, you cannot observe it. It instantly goes to zero or one based on certain probabilities. And the other one, which is very practical uh, implications, is you cannot copy information represented in quantum form. Meaning you cannot have a quantum database because the moment you pull that information from the database, you're copying it. You are destroying the copy in the database to get your own. And this is the concept of teleportation of information with quantum. And yes, the term came from Star Trek, okay? So I can move this information around so I can talk about networking, but I cannot make multiple copies of quantum information. And that changes the way we do a lot of things, including how we correct errors um, that may occur in the hardware. Um, so these two things alone, the first one is related to like, how can you possibly debug a program if you can't see what the values of the variables are? And the second one changes your entire data model of what you have to do. Um, so, so these are the caveats, these are the footnotes, uh, and we have to remember this. Okay, so now with that, with a little warm up on what quantum computing is, um, today we have quantum computers that vary from a handful of qubits up to um, about 1,100 qubits. Uh, and, and let me say the model that most people use, the, the, the annealing model is a little different. Um, but in the pharmaceutical industry, I, I, I went to a talk last year and they, the speaker pretty much said, okay, there's one thing we always do when we're creating a new drug. We, we, we start with one of these. We have to synthesize one of these things. So we said, okay, to understand this fully, using quantum computing, how many qubits do we need? Well, we need about 9 million. Okay, well, the computers we have today, a handful to about 1,100, that's not 9 million. And moreover, you don't just make more qubits. It's not like adding memory to a classical machine or a laptop. You don't just plug it in and away you go, right? Um, at least not, not at the moment, right? And so the point is, is that you can't, all big problems with little quantum computers. Right? You don't want to solve small problems with quantum computers. There's too much overhead. Um, but if your quantum computer is too little, you just can't do it. And so here are these photos um, on the top. Let's say this is a big problem. You, you want to create a state-of-the-art jet fighter, right? Um, exceeds the speed of light, does all the things you can imagine here. Really, where we maybe are is bicycle stage with quantum computers today. And I'm and I'm even kind of, you know, we might be at tricycles, but let, let's go with bicycles here. Well, there's a lot to get done. If you imagined how you would evolve the technologies to get from this one on the bottom to the jet fighter on the top, there are a lot of things that have to come into play. Um, you got to get off the ground for one, right? Um, so there are lots of things that, that have to happen. And that's the rest, rest of the talk here. And, you know, this may a pessimistic or like you know, Bob's, you know, saying quantum computing isn't very good. Uh, that, that's not true. I'm very optimistic, but I believe in being very realistic. And I also want to point out that uh, if you think of uh, the very first airplanes, the very first things, man-made flight, at least in the United States, um, 
done by the Wright brothers. And oh, by the way, they owned a bicycle shop. So I trust that we have some very, very smart people that will over the next five, 10 and more years will get us from, let's say our quantum bicycles up to our, our quantum jet fighters here. Now, one problem with quantum computing, and I pointed out a few related to um, the, the programming model, is that there are lots of things to consider. And some of them are very technical. Gate speed is how fast you can do one operation. Uh, think of it as how fast can you multiply, for example. Now, you don't use a quantum computer for multiplication, but that's what we mean by gate speed. If you have a very slow gate speed, then you're going to do calculations very slowly, right? Circuit depth, how many operations can you do? Um, how many things can you do at the same time? That's parallelism. Uh, more and more people are looking at saying, well, all right, that's a great, going to be a great big calculation. What will it cost me? And maybe even more so, what is the energy use? Now, I'm highlighting this with a little photo here of a power plant because I, I, I saw a poster that a vendor put up and when they were talking about the energy they were going to need, they put a little um, icon of a nuclear power plant. And I'm saying, it's probably not good marketing to say you'll need an entire nuclear power plant to power your one quantum computer, right? Uh, but that will be a consideration. And so these are all trade-offs. That's, that's the idea. So if you want one of these, you sacrifice on some of the others. There are engineering and, and scientific trade-offs here. Um, now, there's another idea called, called cores, quantum cores. And then, so the analogy is, when I got my first computer many years ago, it had one CPU, one processor, and that's all it could do. And it took um, over 20 years to go to um, a processor that had more than one uh, processing engine core um, in it until 2005. And it was called dual core, right? That was really exciting. Um, the last generation of, of console machines for gaming uh, had like eight cores. Uh, this computer, um, this is new, I think this one is 20. Um, this chip that you can see from AMD on the right-hand side is a 64 core processor. And if you happen to have an Apple iPhone 14, not only does it have 16 core, well, sorry, six processing cores, it has five GPU uh, cores for graphics as well as AI, tied in with the 16 core neural engine, right? And, and so this idea of having multiple units of processing uh, must come to quantum computing. Slowly, we're starting to see a couple of results here. Um, but the idea here and, and the, these little squares with the dots, um, just to pick one idea, this is uh, an array of what neutral atom qubits would look like. All right, so th that's how you would lay them out. So just think of that, that's a bunch of qubits. Well, there are only so many qubits you can fit in a core. Then you have to mo have multiple cores. And uh, well, which of these modalities like neutral atoms or ions or photons uh, are gonna be best to do this? And oh, by the way, you know, this, this picture on the right-hand side, this is not um, a computer with nine cores. This is nine computers, one of computers, because you gotta connect them right? Um, they have to talk to each other for all these things, these operations, entanglement has to go across course. And this, this, this fancy word transduction means that no matter how you create your quantum computer, you're probably going to use some sort of optical connectors between them. Because we're not sending just little electrons across as we might to with semiconductors, these have to be quantum connections. And they're subject to noise from the environment and errors and things like this. So we might have to go from however you are representing your quantum information, transduce it into photons, move it along an optical cable, retransduce it to wherever you're going, and keep going. How fast is that? Um, what's the fidelity? That is, how accurately can we, can we do that? Um, unless we do this, the world is going to be littered in five years with tiny, useless quantum computers. And so we better start investing much, much more in this. Individual companies are doing this. I know of two that are putting serious efforts in this. But if the rest of the world doesn't do this, if we don't have more startups, if we don't have more integrated companies that are doing this, 
a lot of the, the current quantum computing efforts will fail because they will not get out of the single core world. Now, this, this notion of connecting cores is really quantum networking, which is saying I'm taking quantum information from one place and I'm moving it to another place. So I could be moving Let's imagine if, if this is all on a circuit board at very low temperature, perhaps, in vacuum, um, maybe I'm moving it a centimeter, right? Nothing much, or a few centimeters. Or I might be moving it a little bit further away. Um, and so I could be connecting a quantum computer to quantum memory, which we're only starting to figure out how to do that. Um, and so this general idea of quantum networking is the term we use instead of quantum communication, right? And we don't want to use the quantum internet because it's all kind of a similar idea. There are different considerations depending on how far away you have to move the information, quantum repeaters and so forth. So this notion of how we do networking uh, doesn't just go between data centers, it goes to the very basis of the cores that we use to create our quantum computers. And this is another area which needs a lot of investment. Quantum software optimization. You know, I, I love my iPhone. It's, it's, it's extraordinary, um, but it's the software I really care about. You know, I want a good camera. You know, I want a lot of memory, but it's the software. It's all the different things I use. And every single time we have one of these revolutions, should we say, new types of processing, Everybody focuses on the physics. And just like I showed you all these different types of modalities, right? Ions and atoms and superconductors. Over time, we talk a whole lot less about the physics and the hardware. We talk much, much more about the computer science, the software engineering, and the applications. And so I raise this specifically because of the university audience here. Computer science departments must get on board to advance what we're doing in quantum computing. We need highly, um, we need fast optimizing quantum compilers, for example. We need to work with multiple cores. There could be a lot of computer science PhDs related to this. We're starting to see this. We're seeing some more, more um, programs done with this, but we people have to accept this isn't only something for physics. And we have to get much more into the computer science side of, of what we're doing here. Now, boy, we have a lot of quantum startups. And with many of these technologies, superconducting, I could look and probably give you 20 different companies, great people, very smart people, uh, ranging from the very small to the very large, like Google and IBM, right? But we have a lot of people doing um, very, you know, the, the, these first stages of this. There's a lot of duplicative work. So when President Kennedy at the early part of the 60s said we will get to the moon by the end of the decade, um, it was, you know, a lot of engineering. We went all the way from, from Mercury, right, through Gemini, through the early Saturn test to the Saturn V, which eventually got us there in a very, very short period of time. But think of the complexity of doing this. Think of all the parts that had to work together. Think about what they had to plan for that they would need in three or four years, right? And not just, hey, we really, we really love doing this. But the situation we have today is that people are so excited about these first stages of creating new devices with a few qubits that it's as if we have a hundred companies in the world and they're all creating engines for Mercury rockets, Redstone rockets. And we don't have outside of the very largest companies, you know, those that have the foresight to say, at this point in the future, we will bring everything together to have a usable quantum computer. Now, the Apollo program took the government, it took NASA. There are other similar programs, right? I mean, even if you just think of my jet fighter before and other things, but we're not doing this with quantum computing yet. And so we, we need to, uh, start changing the way we invest, particularly the way governments invest in these technologies with the foresight and the roadmap, the industry roadmap, not the vendor roadmap, to how we get from the one person Mercury that goes into up, turns around, comes back down, to the Saturn V, 
which with components that get to the moon and back. Um, and, and this kind of brings me um, to my last topic, which is workforce development and well called diffusion. Um, everybody agrees, you go anywhere in the world, workforce development, giving people jobs, giving people training is a good idea. And obviously I agree, right? But we don't just need physics PhDs with quantum. We need a bunch. But, you know, typically the physicists don't create products. And when you're dealing with hardware, right, you, you have the science, you have maybe prototypes, and then you get into an early understanding, the development of how you create products. You figure out how to make factories with automation. And of course, you need sales and all that type of thing, right? So we have to really um, start thinking more broadly about what parts of the workforce are we training? And at, at a uh, global level, where are these people and where can they work? And what are our international alliances? For example, AUKUS, Australia, UK, and the US, is a very, very important, in this case, three country alliance. Um, what should they be doing together, right? To accelerate getting us to useful quantum computers. And so really, I'll, I'll use this as a summary statement here, uh, what I have on the left, and, and I said a little bit, perhaps we need fewer new startups on, on the most basic technology. And that's what I was saying. You know, we really don't need so many people making new flavors of, of mercury engines, right? Rocket engines, we, we need to have them do this. We have to have a better picture and the workforce to actually execute it of everything that has to go into making fully integrated systems that are big enough um, with all the right parts. This may require vertical integration. It may require rethinking supply chains, global supply chains for how we do these sorts of things. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, somebody suggested that the Department of Defense in the US needed a quantum czar that could look across all the different branches of the military and make sure they were operating efficiency without uh, duplicate efforts and things like that. Well, again, if we're not just going to leave it to the largest um, companies in the world, we're going to need something like that. Otherwise, we're going to waste a lot of time. We're going to waste a lot of money. We're going to waste a lot of resources, people resources, that um, are, are not moving us ahead fast enough because they're doing too much at the current level and not developing what we're going to, to really need. So with that, um, I, I will stop sharing here. I am, uh, I, I'm so grateful. I, I'm, I'm sitting here mesmerized and I'm wishing that I, I'm excited for our next panel, but I, I want to invite you back for another conversation with other players here in Montana, I think. That, uh, well, during, fly, during fly fishing season, if I could make one request. What, what, that will happen. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hey, Bob, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so grateful that you spent this time today. I, I wish we had more time to maybe take some questions from the audience, but thank you. Thank you. Well, um, anyone who does have questions, I am on LinkedIn. Uh, find me, and I always love to talk about this material. So um, thank you for inviting me. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I so appreciate your time. Have a great, have a great sure. afternoon. Oh, I see some hearts coming up here. One and claps. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thank you, man. Good. Have a good afternoon. Bye bye.